Coming up on Market to Market. Oversight battles intensify as gene editing moves mainstream. Hunters fill empty plates in the heartland. Those stories and market analysis with Darren Newsom next. All the talk up there was that they were going to switch. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. This is the Friday, November 23 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Delaney Howell. As Thanksgiving dinner settles, the U.S. economy appears to be showing signs of economic indigestion in key indicators, sinking stocks, rising interest rates, and tumbling commodity prices. U.S. home construction increased in October mostly on apartment starts and not single-family units. The sale of existing homes broke a six-month skid to climb 1.4 percent in October. Orders for big-ticket manufactured goods fell by the largest amount in 15 months following trade disputes with China. Agricultural and construction giant Deere & Company posted a 46 percent increase in profit for the fiscal year, largely from a boost in construction equipment sales. As lawmakers spent the holiday week in their districts, bureaucrats in Washington fought for oversight of the expanding cell-cultured foods industry. USDA and FDA announced both will play a role in regulating the booming business, while Congress mulls new regulations. Kathy Young of the Associated Press reports. These cows in California were spared a painful procedure. Dairy cows, like Holsteins, grow horns, and they're quite dangerous for human workers and also for their fellow cows, um, and so they're normally manually removed. Instead, scientists genetically remove their horns through gene editing. It's kind of a pair of molecular scissors, if you will, that you can tell to go and cut the DNA at a very precise location in the genome. And what that enables you to do is go in and very precisely alter one particular gene of the thousands of genes that make up the genome and you can introduce useful genetic variations. Variations like soybeans edited to grow with more heart-healthy fat or mushrooms that don't brown. It sounds like GMOs are genetically modified foods, but it isn't. A lot of the uh, consumer resistance uh, to accepting GMO technology is that we're moving foreign genes from, from other organisms. Using genome editing, what we're doing is changing the sequence of the DNA in the plant, the natural sequence itself. Fruits already coming down. Fred Gemitter hopes gene editing will help save Florida's citrus industry. See very small leaves. It's being devastated by a disease called citrus greening. For Florida, it has cut our production from about 240 million boxes, maybe 15 to 18 years ago, down to 45 million boxes in the last season. Despite its promise, some critics are concerned about how gene-edited foods will be regulated. I think the vast majority of the products will be safe, but somebody needs to be looking out for those cases where a mishap may happen or the developer of the product may miss some important health or environmental consequence. U.S. agriculture officials say no new rules are needed for plants that could have been developed through more traditional methods, clearing the way for about two dozen gene-edited crops so far. That includes the heart-healthier soybean oil. Products made with it will likely hit grocery stores next year. But officials are debating how animal-based products will be regulated. Kathy Young, Associated Press. The price of the 2018 Thanksgiving feast for 10 people was $48.90, or just under $5 per person. The American Farm Bureau's annual survey says the cost is the lowest since 2010. 
Even with the lower grocery bill, USDA says one in eight Americans are food insecure. Several agencies have a mission of helping those in need, and some are getting a boost from hunters. Josh Bittner has more in our cover story. It brings the wildlife in and then it allows that soil to kind of, kind of come back a little bit from being farmed for years and years. Only about half of Mike Nelson's acres in central Iowa's Warren County are devoted to row crops. He's invested the remainder of his rolling landscape in USDA's Conservation Reserve Program. My whole family, the one thing that we enjoy the most is the outdoors and the wildlife that comes with it. And I think a lot of this ground is ground that shouldn't be farmed. It's highly erodible. By having a portion of his land in CRP, Nelson cost shares the conversion of his farm ground to retain topsoil, improve water quality, and restore natural habitat. However, one woodland creature can respond a little too well to such rural accommodations. As a hunter, that's what we want to see. That's telling us that we have a buck in the area. Iowa corn and soybeans might help feed the world, but those same growing areas provide shelter and nutrition for four-legged drifters, which some landowners consider a nuisance. They'll just devastate our crops, and, and if we didn't harvest some of those, we'd just get overrun, and, and we'd have way too many deer. But Nelson has found a way to decrease numbers in his own backyard and uproot hunger locally, thanks to a partnership between outdoorsmen, meat lockers, nonprofits, and state government. We've got as many top 100 scored deer in the country as any other state. We've come on strong. Um, you know, we have one of the most in-demand non-resident deer licenses. We do limit those to 6,000, but our bow deer tags are probably the most in-demand deer license in the country. Iowa Department of Natural Resources spokesman Mick Clemisrud says about 15 years ago the DNR hatched a plan to cut back on a deer population that had become a hazard in urban areas. What followed was the statewide HUSH program, or Help Us Stop Hunger, which allows hunters to donate excess harvest to those in need. Roadkill is not allowed for contribution. Iowa's deer are world-class deer, and they're really a prestigious animal to hunt. And what we've done is we've structured our season so we can make sure that those large-bodied animals can pass their genetics on before the gun season starts. Not a lot of other states do that, and they don't have the same deer quality deer herd that we do. DNR officials estimate Iowa's current deer population at roughly half a million. Clemisrud says herd size spiked around 2007, and an uptick in hush donations followed at over 8,300 animals the following year. The program's first decade saw over 63,000 deer, equaling more than 10 million meals provided by Iowa hunters. Last year, about 3,800 deer were donated, with the largest number coming from Milo, Iowa. Milo Locker co-owner Daryl Goring says that's just shy of 19,000 pounds. And they fully expect to top those numbers when 2018's contributions are tallied next spring. We are in deer country. South Central Iowa is a great place to be if you're a deer hunter. And uh, we're, just, we're just blessed to be here. Processors receive $75 from the state for each animal. The meat is shredded and packaged in two-pound chubs, equaling eight meals each, according to state officials. Real lean, lean red meat. So if you're watching your cholesterol or things like that, then deer's a good thing to eat. Goring says all parties involved benefit under the agreement. And together they've streamlined how hunters contribute. All a hunter needs to do is uh, legally harvest a, a white-tailed deer, properly tag it, field dress it, bring it in. It's really, you know, two minutes and the paperwork's filled out, little index card, and he's good to go. And uh, we take over from there. Over 60 lockers participate in the program and work with seven food banks serving those who are food insecure across the state. Danny Ackright, communications manager with the Des Moines-based Food Bank of Iowa, says proteins like meat are one of the most difficult nutritional products to come by. But in 2017, his nonprofit received almost 73,000 pounds of venison through Hush. 
and he points out the huge advantage of being able to take the show on the road. One of the misconceptions that a lot of people have about those who are hungry is that it's an inner city problem, when really it's an everywhere problem. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. And really, in our rural communities, is one of the hardest places to reach them. They may not have access to traditional food resource like a food pantry or a soup kitchen. So we have to, to design programs like the mobile food pantry to go in and meet those needs in those rural communities. Venison? Oh, I think it's great. I'm not a Des Moines driver, not even very far. So it is nice to have it come to Milo. You know, it's really, really helped. Ackright says feedback from recipients, as well as those canvassing woods and fields, has been overwhelmingly positive. One of the things that I love to hear is when hunters tell us that they are active hush hunters. For them, it's a sport of passion. They love to do it. They will hunt and take down a deer and help feed their own family. And when they have the ability to provide that, that nutritious meat to a family in need, that means something to them. Make chili with it. Mike Nelson agrees. From tree stand or deer blind, he helps manage an Iowa resource with high reproduction rates and few, if any, natural predators. One deer for us is plenty. Otherwise, they'd just go to waste in one of two ways. You'd either have it processed and it sit in your freezer and you'd never eat it, or you wouldn't harvest the deer to begin with and then you'd just be overrun with them. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. We are producing this episode ahead of Thanksgiving to allow our production staff a chance to enjoy the holiday with friends and family. As of Wednesday, December wheat fell 8 cents and the nearby corn contract declined 3 cents. The soy complex mirrored the news surrounding trade talks with China as January soybeans dropped 9 cents. The December meal contract shed 4.30 per ton. March cotton improved 49 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, December Class 3 milk futures plummeted 61 cents. The livestock market stayed mostly positive as the December cattle contract gained $1.10. January feeders rose $2.10, but the December lean hog contract retracted $1.80. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index strengthened 37 ticks. January crude oil continued its six-plus week slide, dropping $2.05 per barrel. Comex Gold put on $5 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index plunged nearly 13 points to finish at 420.85. Joining us now to offer insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Darren Newsom. Darren, welcome back. Thanks for having me again. Blaine. All right, Darren. We're taping this ahead of Thanksgiving, but folks are going to be watching this after Thanksgiving okay. is over on Friday. So we've got a great question here, I think, that sets the stage for this Thanksgiving time feeling. Okay. Darren. I'm interested to hear your answer here. We've got Chad in Randalia, Iowa, at Hort for Sci on Twitter. He said, what's one thing for commodity markets, or what's one thing the commodity markets have given farmers in 2018 that we should be thankful for? <laughs> uh, gray hair, um, uh, ulcers, I don't know. You can, come on, I believe that you can think of a better answer than that. Um, they've had good yields. I mean, despite everything that we've heard, all the horror stories of harvest, and it has been a horror story, um, most of what's come in has been better yields than what was expected. Even, you know, even in areas where they got these 10 to 12 inches of rain over, the, over a couple of days on, on soybeans that were ready to be harvested, their yields came in better than expected. So, you know, I think if nothing else, we've seen better yields than what some were expecting this year. Um, we had some opportunities early on to get some prices. Of course, it all stems back to Twitter and, and whatever comes, the latest tweet that comes out of the White House uh, regarding trade. Uh, so there were some opportunities. Uh, you know, it's tough here at the end of the year to look at, you know, to look back and say, yeah, you know, this has been a great year. But there were little things throughout the course of 2018 that I think commodities did give that, uh, that folks could be thankful for. All right. Well, that's a pretty optimistic from uh, answer me, from Darren yes. Newsom. <laughs> Darren, I want to focus on maybe some more big picture things here mm -hmm. since we've had a shortened trading week this week. Let's talk about big picture stuff here from the wheat market. Mm -hmm. We've had delayed planting in winter wheat. Do you think that's going to leave acres abandoned? Do you think acres are going to get switched in some of those states, especially in the Dakotas? You know, if we, if we look at the plains from the Dakotas down through, say, Oklahoma, Texas, I think we could see some 
of the wheat acre, some of the acres that were planned to go to wheat possibly have to go to something else. I think there is going to be a certain percent of the winter wheat acres that just aren't going to get planted. It just got too wet. Now, having said that, if it stays dry and cold, you know, and, and, and doesn't get overly cold, they may try to go ahead and get some of those acres planted. You know, from the folks I've talked to, it looks like there is going to be a slight reduction uh, from what the early estimates were, where we were going mm -hmm. to see X percent more wheat than, uh, than last year. I think we could see wheat acres come down again because it wasn't very conducive weather. It was pretty ugly weather for quite some time over the course of the fall. Let me ask you this. Considering current market prices mm -hmm. and what's going on with trade and whatnot, do producers have any incentive to plant since we're past that insurance date? Not really. Uh, I mean, we, we, I mean if, they, if they forward contracted uh, some July Kansas City or Chicago wheat on the winter wheat side, they may have some incentive, you know, because they may have gotten some pretty good prices. We saw the spike, uh, the spike rally in, in the wheat markets over the course of the summer. So there could be some incentive if they did do some forward contracting, if they did do some hedging, whatever the case might be. Uh, if not where the prices are right now and, and looking at, the, you know, what the prices could be, there's not a lot of incentive to go out and do it. So I would say they might sit back and wait to see what spring brings. All right. Darren, I want to talk about harvest here. When we look at the corn market, we're about, I think, 90% complete with harvest. Mm -hmm. Does this help add any seasonal support to the corn market? Hasn't yet. Um, corn's about as quiet as it ever is. I mean, we're moving in, if we look at the D's contract, it's somewhere in the 350, 380 range and just hasn't been able to get out of it uh, for what seems like months on end now. Normally we do see a seasonal rally that starts in early October and then tends to last, you know, by and large, tends to last up through early June. We just haven't seen a great deal of buying coming into the market. That having been said, I still like the fundamental setup of the corn market. I do like uh, the way its forward curve or, mm -hmm. or future spreads look, particularly in comparison to soybeans. So if there's a market that could still see a decent seasonal rally, I think it could come from the corn side. I think we could see lit, led by cash if we can continue to see solid uh, export demand. I think that's going to help the corn market as we work our way through winter and into spring. My question is, will we see that, though? Will we see that? I'd give it a better than 50-50 chance. So I'm going to say... Okay. That's, pretty, that's still pretty optimistic you for know, you. All I, right. I like it. <laughs> I don't know what's in the cup. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm all I'm Mr. Optimism here. But, yeah, I think we could see a, nor, a, you know, a relatively normal seasonal rally in the corn market this year. Okay. What about South American weather? We're uh, watching, of course, mm -hmm. South American weather in the soybean industry, but what about in the corn industry? How's that playing in right now? Uh, you know, right now, all the talk was so many soybeans mm -hmm. down in South America getting planted early. There's going to be an early harvest, and it's going to be this, that, and everything else. So I think we're going to see more corn produced. I think uh, Brazil's going to have a larger crop. Weather right now still seems to be fine. That's going to put some pressure on our markets eventually. All right. What about when we look at it from the soybean perspective? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about South American weather because we're ahead of planting, potentially going to be ahead on harvest. Mm -hmm. What's that going to do for our soybean producers here? Well, that means beans are going. Uh, South American beans are going to be coming into the pipeline earlier than normal. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're running about. You know, if we look at where our exports are right now and project it out to what it would mean through the end of the marketing year, we're running about 600 million bushels behind what USDA is projecting at this point. So I think it's going to continue to be tough. I think it's going to be tough on the soybeans to get anything done, to really get any movement going on here whatsoever. And with the idea that, uh, that Brazil is going to look to try to fill that pipeline faster than usual, sooner than usual, I think that just puts more pressure on the market. Okay. Darren, I'm going to take a social media question mm -hmm. here because you're a basis guy. We know you follow that quite a bit here. We've got Glenn in Bryan, Ohio. He says, realistically, what type of change can we expect to see in basis levels for both corn and soybeans? I think you can see some, some basis strength in the corn market. Again, seasonally, we tend to do that. If we see any basis strength coming in the soybeans, it's going to be because no one's wanting to sell right now. And there is this small window of opportunity between now and when South American beans start coming mm -hmm. on. Whatever shipments we have, it's be it to Europe or whoever these smaller countries are who are buying beans right now, that could help support basis slightly, very short term. Longer term, I think bean basis is still going to be in trouble. Corn, I think, is going to hang in there pretty well as long as we continue to have strong demand. Okay, let's talk about the upcoming G20 summit meeting between mm -hmm. the U.S. president and President Xi. 
What's your insight here? Give us your opinion on what producers should be doing ahead of this meeting and then after the meeting. Well, Hopefully it goes well, but we can't predict that. According to the White House Twitter, it's going to be great. <laughs> I mean, all these things are going to be worked out just like that. I mean, it's going to be fantastic. What's the reality? Most likely nothing's going to change. Um, I would, I'm not going to say I'd be shocked because nothing anymore shocks me uh, with the administration, with the trade scuffles, with any of this. Uh, could something occur? Absolutely. But it's because there's something already in the works. It's mm -hmm. not because of the G20 meeting. Uh, the talks will be occur at G20. Do I think the G20 is going to actually do anything? No. But I do think, I think there's a very strong possibility we continue to get messages that you know, things are starting to work out, that we are starting to see some movement in this trade scuffle with China. Let me ask you this. CNBC reported earlier this week that the narrowing U.S.-Brazil price differentials implies greater market optimism regarding U.S.-China meeting coming up at the end of this month. What are your thoughts on that? Does that make sense to you? Does that... Uh, you know, I can, I can understand why they try to make that argument. Currencies fluctuate. Currencies fluctuate a lot, and for a lot of different reasons. I don't know that it really gives us an upper hand. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it really signals anything like any t sort of trade agreement is, is in, you know, is imminent or in the works. Uh, but it's certainly something to watch. You know, the trade, you know, the, the currency relationship between the dollar uh, and the real, certainly something to watch because it, in, a, in, in normal times, it was a determinant as far as where China might start to buy. Mm. All right, let's talk about protein, my mm -hmm. favorite subject, no. Um, we've uh, seen reports now come out that pork and beef demand are starting to pick up. Poultry is starting to pull back a little mm -hmm. bit. Why have we seen so much shift here into beef and pork consumption? Number one, we did see, we did see a little bit of a sell-off. Uh, we, we've seen a sell-off in the, on, on, let's say on the live cattle side. Okay. Hogs, just crazy. They're always crazy. Mm. But we get into this time of year, hogs, you know, pork does start to move. Uh, you know, this is just a time of year where people like to eat meat of any kind. Uh, we've, so we've seen a sell-off in, uh, in the live cattle market, in the feeder cattle market. So that probably helps spur some renewed buying interest. And, you know, if we look at, you know, so far the economy is supposed to be doing really well and there's supposed to be more disposable income by more people. And what are they going to buy when they go to town? Not going to necessarily buy uh, nothing against chicken, but when they're going to, you know, this is the opportunity for them to go out and buy more beef. They have more disposable income. So I think we've been seeing that play into it as well. All right. What about... Uh I want to talk about exports here for a second. Beef exports in mm -hmm. particular up 13.3% year over year through the end of September. Will we be able to keep this pace here going on into 2019? Well, we're not shipping anything else, so we might as well ship beef. Uh, we're not shipping any wheat. We're not shipping any beans, so we can put, you know, we can put other things on those boats. In all seriousness, I, I, I think we can. Uh, that's something we really haven't started a trade war on yet. So I think as long as we... As long as we can keep that demand, I think it's going to keep a pretty good, it's going to keep a good cash floor underneath the markets. What about cattle on feed? We had that report come mm -hmm. out on Wednesday. Placements were well below trade estimates. That was my surprise there. Mm -hmm. What does that indicate to you? Yeah, it was interesting that the placements were that low. You know, if we look at the on feed number, it's a big number. I mean, it's still what, 11, 6, 11, yeah. 11, 7, something like that. Still a huge number, but the placements were down. Uh, what it could tell me is what it does what it kind of hints at is that eventually, three, four, five months down the road, we may start to get through these huge numbers that we've been seeing. Mm -hmm. And maybe by the time we get into late winter, early spring, these cattle on feed numbers aren't going to be running the eight to, you know, six to eight percent above the previous year that we've seen uh, for much of 2018. So that does offer some hope in the deferred uh, live, in the deferred live cattle contracts, at least. All right. We're going to finish it up here with hogs. African swine fever mm -hmm. has dominated the hog news. Are there any other indicators or fundamentals or technicals that producers should be watching in these lean hog markets? Yeah, uh, hogs are just as crazy. I mean, I look at the chart you know, right before it came over. And the hog market is just insane if you're trying to go from a technical point, a po technical point of view. So that if you can't make any sense of the technicals, then that leaves it open to the fundamentals. And they're all over the board. Again, they're very susceptible to whatever the latest headline is. I think if you get a good price, you might have to lock it in. Uh, can we sustain the levels that we're at? Absolutely. Could we fall four or five bucks in the blink of an eye? Also, absolutely. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, I do like where the markets are right now. I'm not real crazy about how, they, how it's acted this week. 
it could see some more pressure as we close out the year. All right. Darren Newsom, always a pleasure. Thanks, Delaney. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but we will keep this conversation going on Market Plus, where we'll answer more of your questions. You can find it on our website at iptv.org slash mtom. As you finish harvest and fall field work, be sure to load up on one of our three podcast offerings, including the MTOM, a behind-the-scenes look at this program and the stories we tell. Join us again next week when we'll explore new research on healthier oil seeds. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Delaney Howell. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com.